No matter where your relationships are at, you can make them better. Good morning, church. Glad you could join us in-house or online today. My name's Michael. I am privileged to be um, a member of staff here at Highlands Campus, and I have the joy of leading our college community during the week, which is an absolute privilege uh, and, and something that I really love to do. What I am not is a relationship expert <laughs> or a theologian. I'm just a guy who loves Jesus and who's learnt a thing or two mostly from mistakes about relationships along the way. And so today is actually going to be quite practical. We've, um, we're, we're a few weeks into this series now on relationships, and you've heard some great messages so far. And um, in particular, last week spoke about, I guess, that, that link between the heart and the hands. The, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks, and how our actions are informed by our heart. What I want to do today is actually go a step back even further and talk about some knowledge because sometimes actually having some practical skills that we can bring to the table in terms of our relationships can be useful, but they still need to be filtered through the heart. It's really dangerous going head to hands. We need to go head to heart to hands, and that's the pathway I'd like us to try and take today. When I became principal of the school six years ago, uh, the first thing that Pastor Ken gave me was a book on church culture. And I went, gee, thanks. My internal dialogue was, this is weird. <laughs> um, but I felt obliged to read it because, you know, you want to do everything your board chair says. And it was absolutely pivotal in what God's done in our college uh, over the last six years. Because it helped me understand that if you don't have the culture right, the best strategy in the world is going to fall flat on its face. And so for the first year, I spoke about nothing except culture till the staff were sick to death of it. But we knew we had to get that right before we fixed anything else. So what's culture? A lot of books would tell us that culture is the way we do things around here. I'd like to take it a step further and go, what's even more important than that is how do we treat people around here? Because we're not treating each other well. Even culture becomes incredibly difficult. In other words, relationships is the foundation of everything. And that's why I think talking about relationships is so critically important, because we all have them. It's not lost on me that we have a Trinitarian God, not just one flying solo, but God in essence is relationship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so I think we're modelled this concept of relationship from the beginning. And then right through scriptures, we see where relationship is key to living. It's key to community. It's what we were designed to be. So it's actually worth spending a few minutes trying to put a few practical things in place that might actually help us get that better. Here's the thing. I read a quote in a book that had nothing to do with relationships or God or anything else last year, but it stuck in my mind. This author said there's always a gap between knowledge and action. We can know stuff, but actually doing it doesn't always necessarily follow suit. It could be that you decide that you want to get fit. You know you need to, you know how, but actually doing it is a little bit difficult. You could apply the same to losing weight. You could apply the same to saving money. I know I need to. I actually know how. There's always a gap between that moment and putting it into practice. And I think it's the same for relationships as well. We can have some keys and strategies, but we need to acknowledge sometimes that it takes a bit of effort and practice to get that right. As I've read books on you know, leadership and organisational culture and all that other exciting stuff, something has struck me the whole way through. Everything's based on biblical principles. It's all ripped off. <laughs> it's rehashed, reused material. But ultimately, everything I've read about good relationships, be them family, be them professional, be them with your neighbour, it all comes back to some basic, basic biblical principles, and that's what I'd like to unpack today. A couple of years ago, uh, I was dealing with a particularly difficult parent. Uh, do you know what? Kids are easy to work with. Parents can be really challenging. Um, <laughs> Even staff, you know, they're fairly easy to work with because at the end of the day, they want to keep their job. But um, <laughs> most of the difficult conversations I've had, 
Most of, the, most of the really tough ones have been with parents. And it's because they want what's best for their child. We want what's best for their child. Um, but you've got this third party involved called the child, uh, who's not always conveying the same information to the other two parties. And, um, and some of those can be really tricky. Look, I am, I am absolutely blessed. 98.98% of the parents in our college are amazing. And I hear stories of what other schools have to deal with. And I think, we just don't have those issues, such as the favour of God on our place. But from time to time, we have those tricky ones. And there was one a few years back which was... Um, particularly difficult, and I won't go into the details of it. And the reality is, this guy's problems weren't actually with the school, but everything's always the school's fault. And so, um, you know, things really blew up, they got ugly, and when he wasn't getting his way, he decided to get personal. And his issues weren't even with me to begin with, but as a last clasp on some sort of control, he went after me and it got really difficult. And um, I started to harbour some fairly not positive thoughts towards this gentleman. And from a worldly perspective, you could say that was justified. But one day when I was fantasising about strangling him, um, (laughs) not really, God absolutely nailed me with this scripture. Genesis 1, 26 to 27, and I'm sure you've heard it before. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image. There's that community again. In our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And I just had that moment where I'm envisioning strangling someone made in the image of God. There's a problem there. That's not okay, regardless of what's been said, what's been done, how personal or negative it's been, how am I relating to this person? Gets worse. (laughs) I then made it to Genesis chapter 2, verse 6. Then the Lord God formed formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. God breathed into the man. You know, the breath of God is actually a metaphor for the Holy Spirit in Scriptures. Not only are we made in the image of God, he breathed into us. Our very livingness is his essence. And so from that moment forward, not only in that relationship, but in every relationship I have, be at work, be at home, be at the neighbour, be at the guy who's cut me off at the roundabout, the way I relate to that, that person needs to reflect the fact that I'm relating to someone made in the very image of God with his breath in him. So I just want to put that out there as the foundation this morning, and I'll keep coming back to it. That's what I've had to learn. Do I always get that right? No. Does it always look like my relationships reflect that? No. But there's a gap between knowledge and action, <laughs> and I'm working on it absolutely. You matter just got real, didn't it? It's not a slogan anymore. It's actually something we really need to live out. So I want to give you three practical thoughts this morning for your relationships. And they're they're, they're common to everything, be it family, be it work, be it the rest of it. Number one, I believe we need to be intentional in our relationships. Number two, I think we have to be direct. And we'll unpack that a little bit later. My third point is that we need to be genuine. If we're going to work on our relationships because we value them and because we believe people are created in the image of our Saviour, we need to be intentional, direct and genuine. So what does it mean to be intentional in a relationship? I absolutely believe that relationships are never static. We don't tick a box and say, I'm in a relationship and then it's done and we move on. It's a little bit like driving a car. I can be cruising on the highway happily at 100 kilometres an hour and I take my foot off the accelerator, what's the first thing that happens? Instantly the car starts to slow down. Unless I'm constantly applying force to that accelerator pedal, my speed is not static. I'm either speeding up or slowing down. And I believe our relationships are the same. There is no cruise control on relationships. We need to be working on them constantly. And I am guilty of this. I've got a lot to uh, improve here. It was Valentine's Day a week ago. Did anyone play the card of, I got you a really expensive gift last year, so I thought it would carry over to this year. (laughs) Doesn't work, does it? 
We need to be constantly sowing into those relationships. Um, for some relationships, that's really easy. The people you like or the people you're forced to spend time with or the relationships you, you, you value, we tend to do that um, really naturally. But even then, I find myself taking people important to me, people who I really value, for granted. And so even in those relationships, we need to be constantly sowing into them. Something I'm really guilty of, I'm just telling you everything I'm bad at today, <laughs> but something I found myself guilty of is I can think really positive things, I can think really nice things about people, but I sometimes forget that unless that comes out of my mouth, they don't know. Yeah. Now that might sound really obvious, but I do that a lot. Maybe once or twice in my life, I may have heard the statement, you love running more than you love me. <laughs> and of course, my instant reaction is, well, that's ridiculous, as if, and I get all offended and wounded and my voice goes up an octave and all those things we do when we're, um, <laughs> when we're getting defensive. And then I stop and I think, what was I watching online today? running stuff. What was I talking about? My next race. What was I thinking about? My training. What am I planning for? What am I spending my money on? That's my thing, by the way. <laughs> and then I reflect and go, you know what? How many times I tell my wife I love her today? <laughs> or how much time do I spend in conversation with what interests her? And I get to the point of that's a totally fair comment. And I feel really bad about that. <laughs> Because which value, well, what do, I, what do I value most? Obviously, my relationship with my wife, but is that what I'm intentionally sowing into? Maybe for that period of time, it wasn't. It was in my head. I was thinking those things. I was madly in love on the inside, but it's got to flow to the outside. And I do the same at work as well. I don't tell my team enough how much I value them, or I don't spend enough time with them just hearing what their challenges are. So we really need to be intentional. Putting it out there. Think about it. Number two, I believe it's really important that we're direct in our relationships. I apologise if you work in any department of this campus because you've heard this before in some flavour. be a little bit different today. But I read a book several years ago by a lady called Rachel Robertson. Not sure if she's a Christian. Wouldn't surprise me if she is, but her material is certainly designed for the wider community. And she actually led an Antarctic expedition of science researchers. She was a youngish female. Uh, the researchers were intrepid, slightly older, hardcore, Antarctic-going scientific males. It was always going to be challenging. But she dealt with all the challenges along the way, learned a whole heap of stuff about leadership and life, and then put together a book. And she uses a phrase, we don't do triangles. No triangles. And that's something we've applied um, in our workplace. Does that mean we have issues with three-sided polynomials? Of course not. <laughs> what we do have issues with is relationships and conversations and tricky, difficult situations that involve three parties. We just don't do it. And here's why. Triangles erode trust and they erode confidence. Give me a show of hands if you've ever discovered that someone was talking about you behind your back without you present. Three people. Excellent. <laughs> I don't like putting my hand up in church either. But I'm sure we've all experienced at some stage finding out that something was said about us and we weren't there. Doesn't it hurt? What's worse is when it's misinformation and you can't clarify it because you weren't part of that conversation. Triangles, those relationships that have a third party involved, break trust, they reduce confidence. Worse still, they create misinformation. It's really problematic. What does it look like? What, 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 when I talk about a, a triangular relationship, what are we actually talking about here? They can probably take a bunch of forms, but just to give you some ideas, I think the classic one is gossip. Gossip can be malicious. There are those people who will set out to intentionally breed misinformation or create havoc or whatever. I don't think anyone in this room, hopefully, uh, fits that bill. But the insidious one, the tricky one, is idle gossip. And we would all say, no, we don't gossip. And then the following week, we'll find ourselves 
part of a conversation where we go, yeah, I think that too. Or did you hear that? Or worse still, we're even party to a, a gossipy conversation where we don't go, actually, that's not okay. That's creating a triangle. They're not here to talk about it themselves. We've all done it. Complaining is another type of triangle. What do you think that Mike's complaining about the amount of colour printing again? <laughs> That's highly topical at the moment, by the way. <laughs> Can you believe he's limited us to 500 colour photocopies a week or whatever it might be? Again, it's really easy to do and I don't think we do it intentionally. Something that's frustrated me a little bit is that in society and workplaces or whatever, we've come up with this term venting. I wasn't gossiping, I was venting. I wasn't complaining, I was venting. I've banned the word venting in my workplace because I think it's just a socially acceptable term for gossiping and creating a triangle. If the issues are that bad, see a therapist, or at least be respectful enough to talk to an appropriate person who's not involved in the situation. Because if you're talking to someone who's directly involved, that's not venting, that's not even therapy, that's gossiping because you're dragging a third person in and you're creating a triangle. Third type of triangle, answer shopping. If you're a parent, you've experienced this. Dad says no, I'll see what mum says. <laughs> you laugh because it happens all the time. Can I say adults do it too? But it might be mum and dad, it might be my line supervisor said no, so I'm going to go and ask the person above them. Or the deputy principal said no, so I'm going to go see what the principal says. Parents do it too. It doesn't work in our school because I've got the best leadership team in the universe and we talk all the time and we don't make decisions in isolation. But it's just another type of triangle that we want to try and avoid. So what's the solution to triangles? The Bible. Rachel Robertson doesn't say this, but Matthew did. And the first time I picked up her book, I just went, this is Matthew 18, it's not rocket science. Matthew 18 verse 15 says this, If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you've won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along. <clears throat> Notice it says take them along. It doesn't say go to them instead. It says bring them into the conversation. So that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. I was reflecting on that verse this morning and went, oh, that's harsh. <laughs> but then I realised two things. One, that was specific to the church and we need to be mindful of that even though the principle still applies. But then I went, how are we meant to treat pagans and tax collectors? They're made in the image of God. They're filled with the breath of God. <laughs> so it's not actually a bad thing. We need to treat them just like we'd treat anyone else. So what does that look like in real life? I guess the key takeaway I want this morning for you to hear is how do we do that well? Because sometimes we can do it really badly and when we do it really badly, it makes the relationship worse and not better. And I think it really comes down to knowing why we want to do it. Having a difficult conversation one-on-one -on -one, with the person involved rather than going in a circuitous route around is valuable because and only if you want that relationship to succeed. That's got to be our motivation. It's not about proving we're right. It's not about making them feel bad. It's not about getting one up on them. Your motivation's got to be, God's called us to live with right relationship with people as far as it depends on us. We need to be brave enough to take the risk, to be vulnerable, to do that thing to make that relationship better. That's got to be our starting point. But motivations are great. We still need some knowledge to filter through our hearts to do that well. So let's get brave and let's figure out how to have a difficult but godly, purposeful, well-motored conversation with someone where everything's not going swimmingly. Point zero, and I've called it point zero because it's more important than point one and it's got to come before it, is we've got to pray about this. Now that might sound cliched and it might sound obvious, but I've done both. I've had conversations where I haven't bothered because I thought I was all over it. <laughs> because I've got the knowledge, I've got the skills, I know what I'm doing, I've done this before, this will be easy, I haven't prayed and it's been an absolute disaster. But I've seen the opposite as well. I have gotten into the habit of when I know I've got a difficult conversation coming up, 
I'm talking the doozies where, you know, that parent's rung up the day before. And I just need to reiterate, 99.5% of our parents are brilliant. But you do have that one or two where they're upset for whatever reason and they've chewed out the receptionist and they're coming to see the principal and we've just got to meet and I've got to hear them out and we've got to thrash it out. I will close the door to my office before they even get there. I will stand and I will claim a win-win situation. I don't pray that I get hurt. I don't pray that I win. I don't pray that they see my point of view. I pray for a win-win situation, even when I can't see what that's going to look like. And you would be surprised how often the miraculous happens. And I go, wow, they totally agree with me. (laughs) And they're walking out going, this is the best school in the universe. We're going to tell all our friends to come. Seriously, that has happened from those conversations that should have gone pear-shaped in the natural. Go into it prayerfully. And if you're going into it prayerfully with the right attitude, a lot of that motivational stuff will take care of itself. So we've got zero out the road. What comes next? Now, I know this is really practical, but I think we need sometimes some things to hang the spiritual on. Timing. The timing of a conversation can be really, really important. Firstly, don't rush it. If it's a relationship that's worth saving, it's a relationship that's worth waiting for. Rushed conversations when we're heated, when we're emotional, when there's other stuff going on and we haven't had time to work through to this point can be really dangerous. But actually the point in time where you have the conversation is critical as well. I would suggest that at five to eight in the morning, when child number one is still asleep, child number two has just spilt their Nutri-Grain all over the bench, Child number three is hopping into their dirty school uniform because we forgot to wash it last night. (laughs) The dog's chewing the couch and we can't find the keys is not an ideal time to go, hey, hon, I just noticed on the credit card statement. (laughs) Please help me understand. That's never going to go well. It's got to be good timing for you, but you also need to respect the other person. I saw that, Alec. (laughs) But it's also, timing is everything. It's got to be a time where the person doesn't feel cornered. You know they've got the time for the conversation. You know that they're going to be receptive. Because remember, what we want is a win-win. This is never a power thing where it works for me and not you. We don't play those games. For me at work, first thing in the morning is not a good time for a conversation. If I need to talk to a staff member and they're trying to line preppies up in two straight lines outside a classroom... Telling them that I'm happy about something is not going to go well. I don't want people to have to struggle stewing on that conversation for the whole day. Neither is, as I'm about to go and hop in my car, a great time to go, I'm really unhappy about what you did the other day, but we'll talk about it tomorrow. (laughs) That's not helpful to them either. Find a time that's mutually appropriate for both. Give people a heads up. Don't catch them off guards. Timing can be everything. Another thing is location as well. Something that frustrates the life out of me, but I've learned is possibly never going to change, is that people have this thing about the principal's office. In my mind, I'm still Mike, the goofy science teacher who, you know, wreaks havoc in the lunchroom and has a bit of fun on the side, and I get on with people. I can be having the most harmless... Co- I might need to catch up with something. I might, be, I might want to be meeting with someone to tell them that I think they're doing a great job. I still don't meet with them in my office. Because I watch the moment they step through the door, they tense up, their pupils dilate, and the first thing that comes out of their mouth is, what have I done wrong? (laughs) And I've just decided I can't change. I even refurnished my office. I got rid of the big desk. I've got this little desk in the corner, and I bought some couches and all that sort of thing. I've got posters on the wall and a plant that I need Warren Sight to keep alive because I keep forgetting to water it. I've done everything that I can to make it a a friendly, hospitable place. But the badge on the door just means that people are going to feel uncomfortable there. So I don't have those conversations in that space. I find somewhere neutral to have them. I might even just wait till I'm finding a staff member walking across the playground and go, oh, I've been meaning to catch up with you. So it's sort of strategically accidental, but it works. (laughs) And the other big thing too, and I've been really guilty of this, is if there's an issue that you need to deal with, with someone that you value their relationship, Just deal with that thing. Don't be tempted to go, and while we're at it, you did this, 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 and this. Most of the time, I get it right. I'm getting better with age. I'm learning from my mistakes. 
But I'm horrified when I reflect on one conversation I had with a staff member, and it was one of those tricky ones where the staff member was a parent. And it wasn't actually their performance we were talking about. It was something to do with their child. And um, I did all of this wrong. I caught them off guard at the wrong time. I asked them to come into my office. So there's the first two things just gone. Timing, terrible. Location, not appropriate. And this was back when I had a big desk. So they're sort of sitting on that side and I'm sitting here. And I laid out what I was unhappy about. And then I brought in issue two, three and four as well. And it went pear-shaped really quickly. That staff member's no longer at our college. And I knew that they were leaving anyway. And I never got the full chance to fully restore that relationship. And I really regret it. Make sure if you're dealing with an issue that you only deal with one at a time. Make sure the when is right. <laughs> Make sure the location is neutral and make sure that you're keeping the main thing the main thing because no one feels like getting ganged up on. Even by, We can actually gang up on someone by ourselves by bringing up more than one issue at a time. So I hope that those kind of help us understand a little bit about the, um, the directness. Be a good listener. When most people are upset, they just want to be heard. Let them talk it out. Hold your tongue. And it's really hard, particularly if they're absolutely wrong. <laughs> but hear everything they've got to say, because when people feel heard, they're then willing to listen. And that could be at home. It could be at church. It could be with your neighbour. It could be wherever. Let other people do the talking, and you'll find you're in a really good position to start with. Also be prepared to be on the other end of a difficult conversation. It's all well and good to be an initiator and say, I've got a problem with someone and I've got some strategies and I'm going to apply my knowledge and I'm going to filter it through my heart, I'm going to pray about it and then I'm going to go for it. Be prepared too to have it come back the other way. And that can be really difficult. I want to relate a story that has really helped me be brave in these situations, both as a speaker and as a listener. Because having these conversations isn't easy. It always feels like the easier option to not have them, but it always ends up worse. We had a, a member of staff several years ago, not, not a teaching member, but someone in, in business services who I used to meet with once a week on a Friday afternoon. 2.30 to 3 was our agreed slot. And you know we'd talk all things grounds, maintenance, finance. We'd review the week. We'd plan the next week. What do we need to be working on? It was a really valuable time. And we'd been doing this for a couple of months. And then one week she said, do you even want me to come? And I looked at her and she said, am I wasting your time? I said, I'm sorry? She said, do you even value what I do in this place? And I was absolutely gobsmacked. And of course I wanted to get defensive and go, but, but, but. And I stopped and I went, tell me why you feel that way. And she said, every week we meet at 2.30 and by 2.15 I know you're looking at the clock above me that you can see and I can't and that tells me you don't value me or my time and I'm wasting it. This is the reality of that story. Back then I had a child who was in kindy here and it was my job to pick them up at 3pm on Friday and if I was late I was going to get charged extra. <laughs> and so I was just keeping an eye on the time to make sure that I did my fatherly responsibilities well. And of course, I relayed that story and she said to me, why don't you just set an alarm on your phone for 2.58? It rings, I know you've got to go, we get our time and I feel valued. And I went, that's brilliant. <laughs> and it totally fixed the situation. But if she'd not been brave enough to have that conversation with me, she could have spent the rest of her life at our school thinking that I'm rude and that I didn't value her. That's the power of a difficult conversation. But she needed to be brave enough to have it and I actually need to listen to what she was saying and not get defensive. And I learned so much from that. Here's the reality of all this, though. It's all well and good. And I think now I do professional conversations reasonably well. Who knows how much tougher relationships are in families than they are outside of families. Two reasons, I think. One is we can't walk away from them. There are areas of life where I get to choose who I hang out with and who I don't. And that's cool. Families, we don't get that choice. We're stuck together forever. But the other thing too is, we actually highly value those relationships. 
We might not always act like it, but they're the ones that really matter and we want to get them right. Do you know, I had a situation earlier last month where there was a bit of tension in my extended family and I was a bit smug and a bit gung-ho and it's like, oh yeah, here we go. We're going to have a family power. Well, I'm, I'm all over this. I've got it all sorted. I've got the knowledge. And the second that conversation started, totally out the window. Absolutely lost my cool, forgot all this, all the blood drained from my brain and went fight or flight response or something and I said hurtful things and I totally messed it. I don't know why I'm telling you that, other than I'm hoping you can relate that they're probably the ones that we need to be most careful about and most intentional about because they really do matter. Finally, just to wrap up this morning, and I think I've touched on this already, our relationships need to be genuine. Having a difficult conversation is not about getting our own way. Having a direct conversation is not about proving that we're right. It's not about the outcome material. It's about the outcome relational. And we need to be really, really careful moving forward in that space. About five years ago, um, someone had a conversation with me where they sat me down and I'd been principal about six weeks at this stage. And they told me everything I was doing wrong. And they really laid it on thick. I don't like the way you're doing this. I don't like the way you're doing that. You're not doing this. You shouldn't have got the job. It should have been such and such. And I just got 10 minutes of it. Couldn't get a word in edgeways. And I knew this person was acting out of hurt. And I knew that, you know, you know all that. Still hurts. But then what absolutely kicked me was the final comment was, oh, I don't mean to offend you, I just needed to be honest. And I thought, that's a dead set lie. <laughs> a, I think you meant to offend me, and B, you didn't need to be honest. <laughs> we say honesty is the best policy, but it doesn't mean it always needs to be spoken. And we need to be really careful about that. It reminded me of a lyric from a Taylor Swift song, <laughs> as things often do. But there's a line in one of her songs where she says, you were casually cruel in the name of being honest. And I've never forgotten that phrase. Are we about honesty or worry about justifying a kick in the guts? Something to throw out there and to think about. Our purpose needs to be restoring right relationships, not proving we're right. I honestly believe that relationships are God's invention. We were created as relational beings. And I think if we can approach relationships from a godly perspective, then we're best positioned to do them really well. Hopefully something has been of use to you this morning. Maybe there's one thing that you thought, you know what, next time I'm stuck in a difficult conversation, that might be of use. Or it might be that you're thinking, you know what, there's a relationship that's not going swimmingly in my life. Maybe it's up to me to do something about that. We never want to be the ones to act, particularly if we're in a fractured relationship. I know so many situations where you've got two people who actually want to restore it, but no one wants to make the first move. Be brave. Value the relationship enough to take the risk and be valuable. Maybe God's leaning on you about a relationship you need to restore. Or maybe, maybe it's your relationship with God that needs to be worked on. Do you know a lot of this applies? Now, I don't think we can out-strategize God in a difficult conversation. That's not what I'm suggesting. But I think those three points still apply. I think we need to be intentional about our relationship with God. We don't become a Christian, say a prayer, text yes to a number, and then it's all done forever. Our relationship with God needs to be something that grows and that we're sowing into constantly. And it needs to be direct. You know, when God sent His only Son to dwell amongst us, and resurrected him from the dead. He created the opportunity for us to have direct relationship with the Father. That was never had before. That was a new thing. Wouldn't we be crazy not to take up the offer? I know so many people who, I don't need to read my Bible because, you know, Doug will talk about it on Sunday. That's enough for that week. Be intentional and be direct. And obviously be genuine too in your faith. Maybe you don't have a relationship with God. Maybe you're sitting here this morning thinking, okay, this, this godly relationship's all well and good, but if I'm going to model my relationship with others or my relationship with Christ, that's a bit tricky for me because I don't have one. And you've heard it said from this stage so many times, we, we ask the question, 
do you know God or do you only know of Him? That's what this is really all about. Do you have a relationship with the living God who created you in His own image, who breathed His life into you and created you for a relationship, who's modelled all this stuff for Him, for us? Or is it just a name that sits there that you're vaguely aware of? Can I encourage you this morning, if you don't have a relationship with the living God, or if you feel like, you know what, it's there, but my foot's gone off the accelerator and I can sense it's slowing down, Today would be a great day to take steps towards putting the foot back on the accelerator or starting the ignition just to carry the car metaphor through. Church, I'm just going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes this morning. If that's you, if you feel that God's tapping on your heart, if you've never made that decision to enter into a personal relationship with the living God, can I ask you not to delay any longer? And if that's you, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand this morning. Everyone else's eyes are closed. No one's going to know except me. But I just want to know who you are so I can pray for you. I see that hand. That is the best decision you are ever going to make. (laughs) There might be other people here this morning who are just going, oh, I don't know. What have you got to lose? What have you got to lose by having a relationship with the God who created the blueprint for your life? Is there anyone else? Church, we're going to pray together. We're going to pray for this person who's just decided they want to enter into that relationship. We're going to pray as a community of believers who know we all need to do better in the relationship space. Father God, we come before you this morning. And Lord, we just thank you that someone here today was prepared to say, yes, I want that relationship. And Lord, we thank you that you are faithful and you are good and you are true and that you work miracles. Lord, we pray that as we go about our lives reflecting your glory, that we would treat people knowing that they are created in your image. Lord, as we engage in the myriad relationships we have in our life, Lord, may our motives always be pure. Lord, will we treat people with honour? Would we be prepared to speak when we need to speak and listen when we need to listen? Lord, we trust you. We thank you for who you are. Lord God, we thank you for your love. In Jesus' name. Amen.